Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Tech geeks converge on the Capitol and committees comment on climate change. We discuss whether the state should push for renewable energy in Capital Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capital Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The governor's budget and the health insurance exchange seem to be the key topics in most committees this session, but climate change came onto the radar recently. But, uh, Experts on the topic report. testified to the Senate Environment to and Energy Committee, explaining to lawmakers the trends and possible solutions. The fingerprints, the patterns of climate change tell us conclusively it's human cause. Let me give you an example. Many people say, well, the sun. John, the sun's getting hotter. That's what's causing it. It's not these greenhouse gases. If that were true, you'd expect days to be warming more than nights. We've observed the opposite. We've observed nights to be warming more. We're observing the poles, the North and South Pole, to be warming faster than the equatorial region. That's not consistent with a hotter sun. Finally, if the sun were getting hotter, we would expect the entire atmosphere to be getting warmer. We're not observing that. We're observing the bottom part of the atmosphere warming, the top part cooling down because we're holding the heat down. So it's the pattern that tells us it's not the sun. Psychologists say that the public is reluctant to accept a problem until there's an obvious solution. And everybody wants a silver bullet. There is no silver bullet, but there is plenty of silver buckshot. Renewable energy, doubling down on energy efficiencies, making government buildings more resilient as well as energy efficient. The state can be setting the lead and should be setting the lead. And this is going to happen. I mean, I, I, in a market-driven economy, you know, can we dictate, thou shalt, or can we lead by example? This, this is a process. And I sense the tide is turning. And when people realize that they can do something good for the environment and their grandkids and save money, OK. That sounds pretty good. Going green will generate plenty of green. Senator John Marty, chair of the Senate Environment and Energy Committee, joins me now to talk about the hearing on climate change. Thanks for joining us, Senator. My pleasure. Let's begin with something that Paul Douglas posed during near the tail end of your committee. And he asked the question, as, the, as we move towards more renewable energy, he said, should this be market driven or should the state take the lead? What's your opinion? Well, I, I think the answer would be both. I think it should be market driven, but you need to have the state push things to speed it up because the pace we need has to happen fast. And how would you propose this? Well, I mean, one of the types of things we do, I mean, the federal government already has some significant incentives for wind and solar power and so on. We have to make sure we have smart structural things to encourage the industry to move that way. When you look at the subsidies that the federal government has given to oil and coal and the nuclear power far and away, I mean the amount of federal government subsidy for nuclear power blows away what we give to wind and solar combined. What was the impetus for you as chair? to even hold this hearing at this time, especially at a time when we're mostly ta primarily talking about the governor's budget proposal right. or health insurance issues? Well, we, we don't have much choice. Uh, the way I, I look at it is that if you read, you don't have to believe the science or understand the science. I'm not a scientist. I listen to what the scientists say. But, but when you look at what's going on in climate science, they're telling us we're going to have climate disruption. We're going to have more severe droughts at the same time as we're having more severe flooding and storms. And you see that. People don't have to believe in climate change. They just have to look out the window. And they see the drought in southwestern Minnesota. They see the flooding in northeastern Minnesota. They hear ha Hurricane Sandy is the new norm. And I think that people realize we've got to act, and we've got to act fast. So. Those scientists, as you were saying, um, they did state that there's no real silver bullet here. So how would you 
prepare maybe an energy, an energy plan that includes a lot of different tentacles. Sure. I think what we can do is learn from what others are doing and recognize, is, as they've said, there is no one technology or one whatever. Lots of these technologies have to develop, and that's where the government incentives can help push the industry in the right direction that way. If you look at Germany, Germany is the country that more than any other country in the world is moving aggressively towards a green energy policy. And Germany's creating more jobs in that field than any other country, too, because they're two steps ahead. But even the German energy minister, he was in Minnesota a couple months ago, and he testified about how many jobs they've created and everything else. He would say, we're muddling through. What's he mean? Why does he mean say that? Because we don't know what technology. I mean, the sun doesn't always shine, as the opponents will say, and the wind doesn't always blow. You need the power on 24-7. How do you do it? With well, storage technologies, batteries, there's a long way to go there. Germans are looking at hydrogen storage where you use excess wind power at night and so on to convert water to hydrogen, which is very, which you can burn. That creates nothing more than water. In other words, it's an environmentally clean process. We don't know what the technologies are going to be. We know we have to push a whole range of them, a lot of these tentacles, as you said, so we can find out what works. So. At first blush, what kind of money do you think is involved in trying to provide the incentives to keep pushing forward with this? In the end, I think it's actually cheaper. I mean, when XL Energy is the largest um, provider of wind power in the country, XL Energy wasn't going into this, hey, let's try this out. It was the settlement in the Prairie Island case 20 years ago almost now. And they were forced as part of the settlement to move into wind power. They were doing because they had to. Now, why do they do it? Because wind power is the cheapest power they can buy now. I want to ask you something that I will ask Senator Brown later in the show as well. But the question that he posed was there was a sense of urgency that was coming from everybody testifying, or most of the testifiers in, in the committee. And when he asked about, he kind of put, um, really probed on the making baby steps, what some would call small steps, to try to gain in this renewable area. And the answer that he got was Rome wasn't built in a day when trying to push forward. Are you satisfied with, with this answer? As chair, how would you move, the, move it forward? I, I think and one of the things the scientists say? and the climatologists and others are trying to do is get us moving and moving as fast as possible without scaring people. If people are in, well, there's nothing we can do about it, the problem is so huge, that doesn't do any good, but I think there is a great urgency. The way I'd put it is no matter how bold we are in moving from a greenhouse gas economy where we use coal and oil and the polluting fuels that not only cause greenhouse gases but also other health hazards and so on, the faster we move from that, no matter how bold we are now, I think 15 years from now, people are going to look back at the legislature and government at state and national level and say, why were you people so timid? because the problem is getting bad so fast and we have such a far range to go in terms of fuel efficiency for cars, in terms of whatever. In the end, it's going to be much cheaper. It's going to be cleaner environment and everything else, but we don't have a choice but to do it. What did you take from this hearing and how do you move forward with what you want to do and how do you set what that What I want to do is say that first of all there was some very good actions taken in 2007. The legislature took a bold set a renewable standard for 2025. Um, what I see we have to do now is first of all see where to push up that standard because that standard is going to have to continue getting tougher and very on an exponential basis. And number two we need a strategy to carry it out. Just having the goal doesn't do anything. Matter of fact the 2015 goals we're not on a course to meet them. That's just two years away. We're not going to get there at the rate we're going. So I think we need to have develop, and my goal in the next year, so it's not just to pass some actions this year, but also to develop a strategy, statewide strategy, that makes Minnesota the leader in this. Because it's not only good for the environment, it's not only essential for the climate, it's also a good way to create jobs. Well, your strategy include more tax incentives, credits, things for both people and businesses to I'm, move I'm sure that will be part of it. Plus, we'll have renewable standards. There's likely to be a renewable standard for solar energy added, added to the mix this year. It'll be a mix of incentives and tax incentives and policy directives to do this. Um, you know, we, it really is something where when you see the flooding, southwestern Minnesota, NPR carried a report about how new industry of people repairing foundations in basements because the ground is so dry in some communities it's cracking the foundations. We can't wait. I mean, our farm community, our agriculture system, we're, we're not able to handle the problems if we don't address this aggressively.
All right, Senator John Marty, Chair of the Environment and Energy Committee, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. The governor's funding for Health and Human Services remains essentially the same as previous levels, but the testimony centered on changes many think need to be made. I just have a, a quick visual aid to, that helps to illustrate how we spend money for housing um, in Minnesota. So um, this first jar, now, and I'll just preface this by telling you that these are our single year appropriations. This first jar is for the mortgage interest deduction. So in 2014, we're gonna spend about $330 million for that. The second jar is $28 million. This is what we spend uh, on homeless prevention services and different kinds of supportive housing. And this last jar is what we spend on shelter. So this is uh, a little less than $350,000 a year. Now the governor's budget proposes um, about $700 million a year in property tax relief for homeowners. So this is, this is what we have for funding uh, available if you're a homeowner. And this jar is a one-time increase, uh, about $1.5 million annually for rental assistance. And that's a one-time increase. So this is what's available if you are at risk of homelessness or currently experiencing homelessness. Now, as a homeowner, I understand the, the desire for some property tax relief, but as, as a Minnesotan, I, I think we, we need to do better for, for folks who are at risk of losing their housing or are currently homeless. The lead minority member on the Senate Environment and Energy Committee joins me now to talk a little bit about the hearing on climate change. Senator David Brown, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for asking me. Senator, I'd like to begin with you with something that Paul Douglas said in that committee. And he essentially posed the question or the thought, the idea of trying to get people to go more renewable with their energy and businesses. He said, you know, is it something that should be market driven or should the state take the lead in this? What is your opinion? Well, I believe the state has taken the lead and now let's let the market drive it. Um, we don't need to continue to make the standard higher and higher. The state set the standard of 25 by 25. Now let's let the market drive it. I think we're well on the way to meeting that and let's give it a chance. Does the state, should the state though, continue to provide maybe incentives? Should they up the incentives? If you're talking about subsidies and yeah. so forth, mm -hmm. um, no, I think we're maybe uh, either we're good where we're at or we've, we've gone a little overboard with where we're at. But if you're talking specifically about wind or solar, um, so I think there's more avenues for solar right now than wind. Wind is getting federal subsidies and um, let's see where the market drives that. And it's, it's interesting because there are so many different tentacles with this and it is such a, it's a broad and very complex issue. So let's kind of hone it in a little bit and let's talk about some of the tone of that committee. And there seemed to be a sense of urgency coming from many of the testifiers. And you asked, how serious should we be with this information? And uh, because there seemed to be, while there was a sense of urgency, they were, they seemed, some of the testifiers seemed content to take baby steps. And they, they said, essentially, Rome wasn't built in a day. Are you satisfied with that answer? Well, no, I'm not. And they, saying that Rome wasn't built in a day seems to indicate that we've just started working on this issue of man-made climate change, with which I disagree. Yes, there's climate change. I believe climate has been changing since the beginning of time. I'm not at all convinced that what we're seeing in our climate changing is due to man-made events. Um, and saying that Rome wasn't built in a day, we've been working on these issues for 20 years. But when I asked, uh, and you're right in saying that the testifiers did have a sense of urgency, they all had a sense of urgency about um, doing something about it. So when I asked, well, how urgent is this? Um, because if it's truly as urgent as they were saying, then we should outlaw fossil fuels. We should go 100% renewables. Um, and when I said, how urgent is it? They said, we need to do something this century. So to me, that's not as urgent. Uh, that doesn't define urgent in my in my point of view. Let's go back to the idea of where we stand with subsidies. And um, 
Should the state, in your opinion, continue down the road of offering them at all, or should this be a federal issue? Well, the, the federal is going to do what they want to do, but um, I think, again, we've got to let the market drive. Uh, it's art artificially depressing the price of wind and solar, and it's in, we're inflating the price of coal. Um, I still think coal and nuclear are the most cost-effective options. Nuclear doesn't emit any greenhouse gas uh, into our atmosphere. Uh, so maybe we should lift the moratorium on nuclear, even though there's not anybody who wants to build a nuclear facility. Um, we should have discussions on many nuclear reactors. Europe is moving that direction, and those are discussions we're not having. We're not uh, polluting the environment in terms of greenhouse gas emissions with that. So maybe that's a discussion we should have. So as the lead minority member, you, you can't craft the policy, but if you could set up um, what you would consider a good energy policy, what would be the breakdown of renewables and natural resources and, 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 and other areas where we get our, right. our energy from? I would lift uh, any restrictions we have on coal and nuclear, but I would also include hydro into the mix. Uh, we haven't included that into the 25 by 25, and uh, hydro's very renewable resource, and uh, that should be thrown into the mix. Are you having these discussions with the committee? Um, I anticipate that we will. We had them in the past two years. Um, I think we have some legislation coming forth on that. Whether it gets a hearing or not, I, I don't know, but um, we need to have the discussion. And getting back to the idea of mar letting the market drive any renew the sense of renewables and, and people purchasing renewables, going solar, going geothermal, <clears throat> you said let's just let the market take this. However, many consumers would like to know that they get a tax credit or some kind of financial incentive to be able to make that switch. So with that understanding, and not to just beat a dead horse here, but do you think the state does play a role in providing the financial incentives, particularly since we are coming out of a recession? The state does play a role, and it is playing a role. And I guess what I'm trying to say is we have some of those in place now. Let those play out, and let's see how people respond to that before we add more on top of that. The state has been taking a lead in, in subsidies and uh, promoting solar and um, wind, and let's let that play out for a while before we pump more taxpayer dollars into trying to subsidize some of these And things. parlaying off of that, do you think the state plays a role of encouraging more research in these areas? Uh, it can. We do have uh, what's called the Renewable Development Fund that Excel Energy uh, has. Um, we cut some of that funding to the U, but in the past they've uh, done fun they've done research. Um, I would like to see if we go back to that in any area that we limit it to our state schools doing the research and not sending grants out all over the country to do the research. I think it makes sense when it's Minnesota ratepayers who are paying into this fund that we keep the money in Minnesota to do the research. But yes, there's a role for that. You know, President Obama did bring up the idea of climate change in his inaugural address. Were you surprised, though, that this was brought up so early in session, on a, particularly a session that's considered one to be a budget year? I was surprised by a lot of the things that President Obama brought up. Yes, uh, climate change. I think he should have addressed the issues of Benghazi and some of these other things that are much more pressing issues to our national uh, security and concern than climate change. But when you talk about climate change, we don't talk about it in terms of scientific fact. We keep referencing it as a consensus among scientists. And in committee, uh, last week I believe it was, they mentioned that the governor has a council, advisory council. Five years ago, what they thought was consensus, they admitted that today, what we believe five years ago isn't true today. So my, the way I concluded from that is five years from now, some of what we believe to be true today won't be true five years from now. So it's difficult when you operate under consensus instead of proven scientific fact. Okay, I guess um, let me rephrase the question, then we're just about out of time, but were you surprised that Senator Marty took on this issue so early in a session that's considered a budget year? No, I'm not surprised. I respect Senator Marty, and it's, it's something he believes in passionately. I just disagree with him on the cause of it. Okay, Senator David Brown, thanks for coming in. We appreciate your time. Thank you. They are self-proclaimed tech geeks, and this group brought their passion for technology to the Capitol for the first time. They were not here looking for money, they just wanted to raise awareness that Minnesota's tech sector is alive and growing. I think one of the most exciting things about when, when you look forward for future opportunities and future growth, um, Minnesota now has more robotics teams than varsity hockey teams in the high schools. Um, and that's the future of this industry, you know? 
kids that are tinkering with things and creating systems that work and help improve human life, these are the systems that will be the future of the industry and create new jobs in our region. You just touched on it, jobs, being the, that that's a priority for both the DFL and the GOP and the governor. How do you parlay that? You're not asking for legislation specifically, but how do you parlay that idea into maybe help this industry, helping the industry grow? Well, and I think that's it. We just want to build awareness. Um, you know, if you open any major newspaper today, you start reading about things like healthcare robotics. Uh, you read about driverless cars. Uh, and the expansion of that. You read about um, Amazon purchasing a company for a billion dollars that's going to automate warehouses. So these technological revolutionary events are happening. Um, we have the capacity in the Twin Cities to seize it and kind of ride the wave of growth that's coming. Um, and that's why we just want to invite a public-private dialogue and really start integrating the pieces of the industry so we can be successful. I think it feels really great to be a part of such a big movement because we really know we're making a difference that will have a long-lasting impact. So that not only are we like creating new technological things and we're just getting kids involved in a really young age. So what do you want to say to other kids, especially since science and technology is so huge going into the future? Um, I'd like to say that it's really great to get involved with and that I think it's really important that every kid has an opportunity like this to get involved with it so that they're really setting up their future. Senator David Osmick is a freshman legislator with more than a decade in local government experience. He sat down with us to give us the inside perspective on what he hopes to achieve in his new role as a senator. I want to begin with something that I saw on your campaign website. There was an endorsement that essentially used the phrase, leadership is a byproduct of experience. So discuss your experience in business and on the Mound City Council and how you hope to build on those experiences here in the Senate. Sure, uh, leadership comes with, uh, with that time, working with people, working with your colleagues, working across the aisle, working with people that you don't necessarily agree with all the time. And it takes that type of leadership to really be able to understand what happens here in St. Paul. Because you know, a lot of times people will say, well, Republicans and Democrats, you guys don't agree upon anything. Truth of the matter is, we agree probably about 70 or 80 percent of the time. Matter of fact, I'm actually working on a couple of different things with Senator Dibble. One of them he helped me on was a transportation issue regarding some, using the, uh, uh, using the uh, shoulders on 494. Also, he's very interested in some of the privacy aspects of the, uh, of the uh, license plate recognition software that is out there, and I'm very interested in that too. So um, that type of experience, having that 11 years on a city council, really leads into being able, to be, being able and ready and prepared to take the next step, which is here in, in the Senate. Your website also stated, quote, the only way to tame the beast is to stop feeding it. I've done it and it works. So where are the areas that you consider the beast here at the state? I wouldn't be exclusive. I think all areas have plenty of areas where or space for us to be able to contract. Uh, in my city, and that's where I make the basis point on, and it probably is it's in the small little leagues as opposed, as opposed to the big leagues here in St. Paul, is that you know we found that once we said, okay, we're going to either keep the budget the same or reduce the budget, suddenly our administrative staff and the people that work for us at the, at the City of Mount actually started to look at things in different ways. Primary example, they found they changed their uh, snow plowing routes five different times within a winter and found the most efficient route to save the most amount of time, least amount of gas. Those type of things don't happen unless you impose it upon them and say, we have to make a change. We can't keep doing the same things that we did before. Same thing goes here with, in St. Paul. We have to find different ways to go about things. And I've only been here for three weeks, so it's hard for me to say, oh, point to one thing and say, we can change this. But it's that attitude that you need to bring into the staff and bring all the way through the administration that we can do more with less. And we just have to have people that really want to do that. Other areas of concern for you are K-12 funding, protecting vulnerable adults, and reforming LGA. And these concerns aren't necessarily partisan. So do any of the reforms that have been proposed thus far fall in line with your beliefs? 
Um, I haven't been. I haven't looked into into great detail into what the governor has proposed, but I think there's some common ground that we can do in local government aid. My city has actually had its lo local government aid stripped many many years ago, and and I actually went in at one point in time to then Speaker of the House Senator or, uh, Representative. Uh, uh, Steve Svigum's office, I pointed him straight in, in, into his face. I said, you cut my LGA and you did the right thing because we didn't necessarily need it. It turned almost into a drug that we were addicted to and every year we were holding our breaths waiting to see what was going to happen. Now, we can all agree some cities need help. There are some counties that need help. If they don't have that kind of assistance, they may not be able to survive or even provide basic services. Those are the cities that really need to have it. We need to have it focused, though, on the cities and counties that need it, not necessarily on cities and counties that have a broad commercial, residential, and industrial base that can be able to support the, init the property initi or taxes of that city to support that operation. You talked earlier about work you're doing with Senator Dibble, so on a bipartisan basis. So essentially what kind of an impact do you think you can make as a member of the minority party now that session is here? Well it takes coming in with a good attitude because we are in the minority and I am number 27 out of 28 so my office is in the basement not next to the furnace but I'm the guy next to the guy next to the furnace so uh, you know you have to come in with the attitude that you can make it change and we have to find common ground and there are going to be times where we don't agree and uh, that's probably going to be about budget time and we start looking at tax increases and things like that but there are things that we all agree upon safety in schools we certainly need to increase our the our ability to keep guns out of the hands of people that shouldn't have them for mentally ill people they shouldn't have them if you are a felon and if you were a felon as a juvenile you shouldn't be getting access to guns. Those we can all agree upon and we should have a 21st century computer system through the BCA that can actually identify people and make sure that we keep those guns out of their hands. Those are the kinds of things we can all agree upon as citizens of Minnesota and as Republicans and Democrats. Let's move away from policy issues and just give me what your overall impression of the Minnesota Senate is thus far. Uh, it's uh, it is everything that I believed and more. Uh, I, the first, the first uh, session we had when we were, when we were sworn in, uh, Senator Bach actually mentioned the fact that there were approximately uh, uh, 1,300 or 1,400 people that actually had served through the entire uh, history of that chamber. And it was really interesting. I had, it took me back on my, on, my, on my seat going, I can't believe that I am here. Uh, that a kid from western Minnesota lived here, lived in Minnesota all my life, uh, lived on a farm baling hay and working for, you know, I was loaned out to neighbors for all kinds of purposes, and uh, working on a farm and then uh, be able to come and serve in this body, it was, it was very humbling. Any big surprises yet? Uh, you know, I, sometimes I think, again, it goes back to that bipartisanship. Sometimes you come in here believing that the, the other side has horns and a tail, and they think that you have the same. And I think in talking with some of them, you start to break down those barriers, and then we can find more of that common ground. And I think they're learning about me, and I'm learning about them. And as we move forward, I think we're going to find out again that we want to do the best, and we won't always agree upon things, but we'll always be respectful, and we'll find common ground when we can. That wraps up this week's Capitol Report. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.